Good morning. Thanks for coming on a bright and early Thursday. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's a little warm today, uh, warmer than it has been. Uh, that leads to this feeling of stickiness and humidity produced by capillary forces. Humidity is not produced by capillary forces. Stickiness is produced by capillary forces. And that is the topic of today's lecture. Capillary forces are responsible for a wide range of phenomena in everyday life. Um, the rise of, of liquids in a capillary tube, the uh, spreading of liquids by capillary action in, uh, in paper and trees and lacrimal ducts in the eyes. So there's no pump that squeezes the tears out of your tear ducts. It's all by capillary forces. So how do capillary forces work? Capillary forces represent a, uh, a balance in free energy between the uh, between interfacial surface uh, energy, energies, between a liquid and a solid, the solid in the gas phase and the liquid in the gas phase. And sometimes in the case of capillary rise, we're also concerned about the, uh, the, the force due to gravity that's serving to pull the liquid back down into the, uh, into the beaker or, or pool or puddle or whatever uh, it may be. So this is largely chapter 17 in Israelishvili. Um, I would also suggest uh, looking at the Dijen book, which is on reserve in the library. It's a little, its discussion of capillarity and wetting is, is much more complete. It's a really nice shortish uh, monograph on the topic and Dijen won the Nobel Prize um, for his, uh, his work in this and, and other areas. Okay, so let's start with, uh, with the derivation of capillary rise because while not every capillary, not every instance of capillary action occurs in a tube, the principles are the same. So capillary rise is one of the first and easiest ways to measure surface tensions and interfacial uh, free energies. And suppose we have a tube which is at, uh, which is stuck in some, which you, which you place in some container of liquid. And if the liquid wets the material of which the tube is made, there will be a meniscus that forms uh, up the side like this. And if we have, and the liquid from underneath will, if this capillary tube has a favorable interaction energy with this liquid, will rise to some height. And the height is taken by convention between the between sea level, as it were, and the bottom of this meniscus. So remember, in chemistry lab, you always measure the liquid from the bottom of the meniscus. And it rises to some, uh, to some height h. The radius of the cylinder can be given by, uh, by r. This is, say, a glass tube. And in our analysis, we're going to call this S for solid. This reservoir and the liquid, um, we could, we'll just say this is water. And we'll call this L for liquid. And out here is uh, G for gas. It doesn't have to be glass, doesn't have to be water, uh, but it is uh, for our purpose, purposes right now. We're going to define some quantity called, uh, called I, the imbibition parameter, which I will write in a moment. It's the thirsty parameter, and it is represented 
by the difference between the, uh, the solid gas interfacial energy and the solid liquid interfacial energy. And the liquid will rise if I is greater than zero. This is the thirsty condition, technical term. And we get this, of course, if gamma uh, SL is less than gamma SG. By Young's equation, the imbibition parameter has, uh, has, a, different, uh, has, has a different definition is really the same definition, but we can just rewrite it by Young's equation. And this is from chapter uh, 10, right after the first midterm, gamma SG minus gamma SL, which is the imbibition parameter, is gamma LG, the liquid gas, um, uh, interfacial surface tension, or just surface tension, uh, is uh, times cosine theta, where this is the contact angle and this is the contact angle between this liquid and this gas on this surface. like this. And we can see that the liquid rises if theta is less than 90 degrees. So if this is a, a wetting condition. like if a child is really scared at night. How do we calculate the rise of the liquid in the tube? We do it by minimizing the, uh, the energy. So the energy of the, uh, of the liquid in the tube is some contribution because of the gain in surface energy that you get by covering some high surface energy uh, solid with the column of liquid, which is uh, the, which is the change, which is the surface area of the inside of the cylinder minus two pi RH times I, the difference in surface uh, energies, plus you have some, uh, some gravitational term. So this one serves to lower the energy, and then we have some parameter that serves to, uh, to, to increase the potential energy, which is the gravitational pull against the column of water rising in the tube. And that is one half pi r squared h squared rho, which is the density of the liquid, g, which is the acceleration due to gravity. I'll show where that comes from in a second. This is the negative gain in surface energy, or let's say interfacial energy. And this is the, uh, the positive cost against gravity. Where did this come from? It's really just MGH written in a funny way. So MGH 
in this case equals the volume of the cylinder of liquid times rho times g. Now it's not h at the top of the liquid, it's h at the center of mass, which is one half h. So that's where the one half comes from, and that's where this term comes from. Now, in order to, uh, to see at equilibrium how high the water is going to rise, we take the, uh, the derivative and set it equal to zero, and we solve for h. So the change in energy with respect to the change in height equals zero, equals minus two pi ri plus pi r squared h rho g or pi r minus 2i plus r h rho g or minus 2i plus r h rho g or 2i equals r h rho g looks like I'm writing like a three-year-old unless I do this <laughs> it still looks like a three-year-old's writing h equals 2i over rho g r or usually this is written by substituting Young's equation in for, uh, in for i. So h equals 2 gamma liquid gas, which is the surface tension, times cosine theta, which is the contact angle, times rho density of the liquid, g acceleration due to gravity, and r the radius of the cylinder. And this is called Juren's law. One might ask oneself, what happens, uh, what circumstances might lead to a scenario like this? What, what liquid might give a really uh, a convex surface area, convex surface? Mercury. Mercury might do that because mercury has such a high surface tension that it doesn't want to, uh, want to spread out. How about what type of material might we use as a tube to encourage this kind of behavior? I want something that does not want to be wet. Ever heard of the Teflon Don John Gotti? Uh, nothing affected him, supposedly. I know nothing about this guy other, other than he's called the Teflon Don because things just rolled off his back because he was made of Teflon. And uh, if this tube were Teflon, it would resist wetting by the column. Let's do a couple of little thought experiments and, uh, and we'll, we'll play with contact angle and Juren's law just uh, for a little bit. Suppose you had a droplet of some of water on some surface. This is the gas, liquid, and solid. And this is the contact angle theta. And we're told that the surface energy, surface tension of water is 72.8 joules per square meter or Newton per meter. 
So remember that the surface energy and the surface tension of the liquid have the same numerical value but different units. So suppose we're given, uh, we're given a question, is this surface most likely to be Teflon, polyethylene, or cellulose? What do we know about Teflon? So Teflon is a bunch of CF2 units. So Teflon is really Teflon is this. What do we know about fluorine? It's very electronegative. What do we know about what does that do to its polarizability? Gives it a very low polarizability. It gives it a very low polarizability, which means that if a, if a liquid film is on it, it doesn't induce a strong dipole in Teflon and therefore it doesn't want to interact with Teflon, so water beads up. So I can tell you just um, on a given Teflon surface, this depends on the actual surface and the roughness and all that stuff, which we'll talk about qualitatively uh, later, it's definitely gonna be greater than 90 degrees. Um, you're definitely gonna have a, a situation where on Teflon water will look like this. Basically, you'll turn water into mercury by changing the, uh, the, the substrate to something that's not, uh, not wet easily. Okay, we have a couple of other options here. So cellulose, cellulose is a biopolymer. It's a carbohydrate. It has lots of OH groups on it, lots of dipoles. So it's probably gonna be wetting or non-wetting? Wetting. wetting. So we can say that, um, that, the, uh, that the contact angle on cellulose is going to be less than 90 degrees. And by process of elimination, polyethylene, somewhere in, in between, we don't know exactly what it's gonna be, but we'll say it's greater than 90 degrees by a little bit, but not as much as Teflon. Okay, so suppose, uh, suppose we measured this, we got our uh, protractor out and we measured it. Now, if you're doing this in a lab, the, you actually use the, the um, the instrument used to measure a contact angle is called a contact angle goniometer. Seriously? Uh, and suppose we measured this at uh, 40, say this was 45. Now, which one is it gonna be? It's probably Probably cellulose. Okay, so let's use the numbers for cellulose. So suppose we were asked to calculate the liquid solid interfacial energy between water and cellul cellulose, you would use the the young Dupre equation. Which just says that gamma gas liquid times one plus cosine theta equals the work of adhesion between the liquid and the solid. And the relationship between work of adhesion and interfacial energy is a factor of two. So two times the energy of each interface gives you the work that it takes to pull two of those interfaces, uh, interfaces apart. So now we're just gonna plug in our numbers. The gas liquid or liquid gas Interfacial energy or surface tension is just the surface tension uh, of water in air. 
So 72.8 joules per square meter times one plus cosine 45 degrees equals two times gamma liquid solid and gamma liquid solid is therefore 62 joules per square meter. Second part, how high uh, would liquid rise in a capillary tube of diameter uh, one, one half millimeter? One half millimeter or five hundred microns. Well, for this, we need the Geron equation, which is two gamma liquid gas cosine theta over rho GR. And if we plug in the numbers, we get 2 times 72.8 joules per square meter cosine 45 degrees. The density of water is 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter times G, which is 9.8 meters per second squared times 0 0.00025 meters, which gives you a height of 40 meters. So this is quite an impressive effect. 40 meters is the top of a tall tree. Uh, in, fact, uh, in fact, there are no pumps in trees. So in order to nourish the leaves all the way at the top, there has to be some, some wicking of the water in the, in the cellulose of the tree, which is wetting and produces this capillary force. What's the, uh, the mascot of Stanford University? Anyone know? Redwoods. The Redwoods. They, they have this mascot that runs around in the field. I don't know what his name is. Tree? Tree? The tree? Okay, he's a tree. And the tree is actually a real tree in the city of Palo, Palo Alto, um, uh, which means tall stick. And um, uh, the tree is, uh, if you go to the Stanford Shopping Center and you look across Alma Street, you can see the tree. It used to have two trunks. Now it only has one trunk. It's uh, 1,020 years old, I think. Uh, and um, unfortunately, its roots no longer reach the water table. It used to be much taller than, than it is, but it lost one trunk and then the top of it kind of got sheared off. So if you're driving through, um, you can kind of see the, uh, the broken trunk at the top. But anyway, poor old El Palo Alto um, no longer reaches the water table with its roots. So there's actually a, a, a pipe in there that's like kind of, implant, kind of embedded in the side of the tree that, uh, that nourishes it, otherwise like the richest community in the, in the world would lose their mascot. So, uh, so there, there it is. One time I went on a pilgrimage to go see it. That was, that was fun. Have you seen it, Andrew? You, you, you've never seen it?
how do we quantify the the pressures produced by these surface tensions that cause deformation of liquid solid interfaces. So there's actually a pressure difference in between a bubble or a droplet and the exterior environment or between, in, uh, between inside a meniscus and the exterior environment. And that is uh, called the Laplace pressure. which is defined as the pressure difference not the absolute pressure it's the pressure difference it's like the excess pressure inside versus outside a bubble droplet or meniscus. So a bubble, uh, what's the difference between a bubble and a droplet? A bubble usually refers to some gas phase and some condensed phase, whereas a droplet is two condensed phases, one of which is immiscible in the other. The bubbles and droplets can be, uh, are usually spheroidal or ellipsoidal. So a droplet has two semi-major axes, R1 and R2. And we'll say, we'll draw these lines here to indicate the fact that this is a different phase than, uh, than the exterior. A bubble is like an inverse droplet. Where maybe this is a condensed phase and interior is a, uh, is a gas phase, R1 and R2. It also works for menis meniscuses or menisci. where this is some round object like our finger that's wet, pressing down and lifting up a little bit on a flat surface. And in this case, we're talking about radii of curvature of the, of the meniscus. So what, so as a, so each one of these scenarios has a, uh, has a, an interface that does not want to be there because interfaces mean that favorable interactions between the, uh, between the media, between the molecules in the media that have a stronger van der Waals coefficient are prevented from interacting with themselves in the bulk because of the interface. So the same thing that we, that we talked about at the very beginning of, uh, of our discussion of surface forces, there is going to be a pressure that tries to minimize the absolute amount of interface here to get as many molecules into the bulk as possible. And the pressure produced by this squeezing due to the surface is the Laplace pressure. The Laplace pressure always points in the direction it serves to deform an object in its concave direction. The pressure vector emanates from the concave direction. I don't know how to spell emanates. So I'm just going to say from. What's more embarrassing to admit you don't know how to spell something or to spell it wrong on YouTube? 
pressure from the concave uh, direction. So like for a sphere, the pressure would serve to squeeze it in like this. Whereas in a meniscus, the pressure would, would want to push out this way. Now I'll show you uh, what the Laplace pressure is. Uh, they follow really simple equations and then I'll, I'll show you where it comes from. The Laplace pressure for a sphere, two gamma over R. That's easy. Just the interfacial energy between the two media and the radius of the sphere. A, um, a Laplace pressure for an ellipsoid is gamma times one over the first semi-major axis, R1 plus one over the second semi-major axis. And the Laplace pressure finally for a uh, for a cylinder is just gamma over R. So pressure from the concave direction, so let's say pressure, pressure drives the interface. drives the interface in the concave direction. That's a little more accurate. Pressure drives the interface in the concave direction. What does this mean for, uh, for air bubbles in water? Air bubbles in water, they seem like a pretty hospitable environment inside. Seems like you might want to live there. But what happens to the pressure inside a bubble as we shrink its, uh, its radius? So if R equals one millimeter, the Laplace pressure up here, which would just be two times the surface tension of water in air, 72.8 uh, newtons per meter or joules per square meter, divided by the, uh, divided by the, the uh, radius of the sphere, so 10 to the minus three meters, gives you 145 newtons per square meter. Is that a lot of newtons per square meter? Mm. Not really. What's atmospheric pressure in newtons per square meter? 100,000. 100,000 100, newtons per square meter. 10 to the 5. So this is just... So this pressure is the excess pressure. It's a difference in pressure inside the bubble. There's just a little bit more pressure inside the bubble than outside the bubble. But I think you can see since we have this inverse dependence on R, if we change this to one uh, micron, one micron bubbles are totally findable in, uh, in engineering systems. Hundred forty five kilopascals. So now we have an extra uh, an extra atmosphere of pressure inside the bubble. The absolute pressure is now two atmospheres. But what if we have a bubble with one nanometer or a droplet with a nanometer uh, uh, radius, then we have something uh, ridiculous. 
145 uh, megapascals. So a 145 atmospheres inside the, uh, is that right? Yeah, 145 atmospheres inside the bubble. The huge amount of, of extra 140, huge amount of pressure inside the, <laughs> huge amount of pressure inside the bubble. Um, and uh, as, a, as a result, uh, there have been um, ideas in, for example, uh, uh, cancer therapy. I don't know where this, where this lives in the, whether or not this is, is actually being seriously pursued anymore, but, but emulsions of small bubbles that will, that will dock to cells and then release their contents and blow up the cells because there's so much extra, so much extra energy uh, due to uh, a pressure in there. Okay, where did the Laplace pressure come from? We have these uh, two gamma over R, that's pretty simple. Well, um, this is on Degen. Uh, page seven. His explanation of this is less hand wavy than Israelishvili's, so we're going to go with it. Suppose you have an oil phase. Could be it could be air, and and uh, so the oil phase is inside, and the water phase. We'll call this O, and the water phase. is outside and we'll subscript it W. And we're going to consider the change in potential energy done as the, uh, as the, or the change in, in work done as the bubble either contracts or expands, as it does uh, work against the exterior system and as it, uh, as, it, as, as it expands or contracts, it also changes the interfacial area. So this droplet has radius r, and we're extending the radius by some distance dr. And we have the pressure of the oil on the inside and the pressure of the water on the outside. So our goal is to uh, calculate work if interface is, dis is uh, displaced by dr. So we have dw is equal to the pressure volume work done in the oil phase and the pressure volume work done in the water phase plus some change in, surf in total surface energy due to expansion of the interfacial area. So the change in area, incremental change in area times the interfacial energy per unit area between oil and water. Now we have dVs and dAs, but we don't have dAs and d, 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 dVs and dAs here. We only have Rs, so we need to convert the dVs and dAs into Rs. So dV of oil is 4 pi r squared dr, which is the derivative of, the, uh, of the, the volume with respect to radius. And this is going to equal minus dvw, because as one expands, the, the other uh, contracts. 
and our dA is going to be 8 pi r d r, which is the derivative of the surface area of a sphere. So we'll use these substitutions. And we have dW equals minus P oil, the pressure in the oil, times 4 pi r squared dr plus uh, plus P w 4 pi r squared dr plus gamma oil water dA now this is zero at equilibrium no change in potential uh, uh, energy at equilibrium and if we solve for PO minus PW we get gamma oil water times 8 pi r dr over 4 pi r squared dr p oil minus pw is the laplace pressure because again it's just the difference between the pressure in the two phases and this is why I prefer writing with chalk instead of a whiteboard, because you can cancel terms like Zorro. It's the whole reason I wanted to be a professor, so I could do that. And we have two gamma ow over r equals pl. And a similar, uh, and this is what we had up there, right? And you can make a similar geometric argument for cylinders and ellipsoidal geometries, but we're not going to do it. Uh, for the sake of everybody's sanity. Okay, we've been thinking about smooth surfaces, but surfaces generally aren't smooth. Silicon wafers are smooth. Mica is smooth. Is glass smooth like a microscope slide? S sort of, not, not that smooth. Can definitely have roughnesses in the tens of nanometers in evaporated film um, of, of some metal even though it looks shiny, actually has quite an appreciable roughness. So what do we, how, do we, uh, how do we think about surface tension with, uh, with rough surfaces? So there's some surface tension, some roughness, some, uh, some macroscopic contact angle. So let's say that, that we approximate the rough surface as just a rough plane, so the plane of the rough surface. The contact angle here is just going to be the, uh, the contact angle that we would observe from a distance. We're not going to zoom in, which is like, what is the contact angle? What is the normal contact angle that, that it makes with a, uh, with a surface? So 
So theta we will define as, really it's the same as before, but, but it's the macroscopic observed contact angle. But we need another contact angle to complete this analysis that implies that if we zoom in far enough, the contact angle is not going to be the same. So theta zero is the contact angle that you would obtain if this were completely atomically flat. And we need a modified young dupre equation to account for these uh, for this difference. We have gamma one plus cosine theta times some parameter phi times the work of adhesion between the solid and liquid. Now phi is going to be the uh, the fraction by which the contact area is greater than or less than the footprint if you look from an airplane down on the droplet. So it's the fraction by which the contact area is greater than or less than the footprint or the projected or the projected con contact area. Now the work of adhesion by uh, by the Young's equation or by by the uh, the Young the the Young Dupre equation is equal to gamma one plus uh, one plus um, cosine theta of um, on a flat surface from previously in the class when we were only considering idealized flat surfaces. So we can rewrite this as. 1 plus cosine theta plus equals, sorry, not plus, equals phi times 1 plus cosine theta naught. So what does this tell us? It tells us that for phi greater than 1, the observed contact angle is actually going to be less than the contact angle on a flat idealized surface and this gives you more more wetting and this is greater surface adhesion per unit of projected area that's kind of what we've shown here this area this actual area is going to be greater than the projected area because we have all of this all of these asperities in the uh, in the flat surface now suppose we have phi less than 1 and this, you might get this with, uh, with air pockets. Say, instead of this scenario, you had a scenario like this, where the bubble, where there was air underneath it. 
Now, air is hydrophobic, so you might have a uh, you might have kind of a composite surface that's really the surface plus the air that's trapped underneath, and you might therefore get a, uh, a less wetting surface, which is generally what you get. So theta greater than theta zero, and we have less wetting. In general, In general, the effect of roughness is to exaggerate the intrinsic surface energy. If it's low surface energy, you'll get even more beating of the droplet on the surface. If it's, high, if it's a high surface energy solid surface, you'll get even more wetting. So in general, roughness exaggerates Hydrophobe or philicity. No, is that good enough? Oh, that's awful. So, in general, the effect of roughness is to exaggerate hydrophobic or hydrophobic or hydrophilicity. Now, phi is really hard to measure and to predict. Often these measurements are done um, with some amount of, uh, some amount of er uh, error. It also depends on, uh, on surface chemistry, surface adhesion. So for example, a really clean surface, like if you take a glass surface that's normally hydrophilic and you put it in the plasma oxidizer or the UV ozone cleaner or piranha etch solution and you just oxidize the hell out of it and it's really hydrophilic, it actually only takes a few hours before organic stuff in the air like um, from plants and our exhalations start to cover the surface with this layer of, of junk. So if you plot the, um, the surface, the, uh, the contact angle of water on a glass slide over time, it actually starts out flat and then, and then it eventually starts to beat up. Not like Teflon, but eventually the surface tension actually does, uh, or sorry, the, the interfacial surface energy becomes, uh, between the solid surface and the gas, becomes less because of the absorption of this uh, organic crap from the atmosphere. So it actually doesn't take that much more integrated contact area to really change the uh, to really change the the uh, the macroscopic behavior. So, for example, for for very hydrophobic or sorry, very hydrophilic. For very hydrophilic surfaces, let's say clean glass, if our contact angle on a flat surface is 10 degrees, that's pretty, pretty hydrophilic, and our integrated contact area is 1.000, because we like significant figures then our observed contact angle is just going to be the same. But if we increase our contact area just by adding a little bit of roughness, one point zero zero eight, the observed contact angle goes down to essentially zero. This is a complete wetting. The kid is really scared of the dark. Incidentally, 
It's really hard on a glass surface to measure a 10 degree contact angle. Um, I mean, of course, you can, you can actually measure it, but if you have any, any amount of roughness, appreciable roughness, then, the, then it just spreads out and the water wets the whole thing. Okay, how about, uh, what does a scenario of, of super hydrophobicity look like? Like the lotus leaf effect? Anyone seen those videos where you pour honey on a lotus leaf and you can slide it around and the honey doesn't even stick to the, to the lotus leaf? What's going on at a macroscopic level? And this, this could be a whole course, so we're just gonna take a snapshot uh, of, of a scenario. For hydrophobic surfaces, in which theta naught is greater than or equal to 90 degrees, picture uh, thermodynamic equilibrium. saturated vapor. Suppose you had some surface that really was, had some sinusoidal roughness. So let's just really exaggerate this. Even if you had a contact angle in a, on a flat surface of 90 degrees, it would still give you an effective contact angle that was much, uh, that was much greater than 90 degrees. So this is the plane of the, uh, of the, I'm sorry, I drew this in totally the wrong spot. If this uh, dotted line here is the plane of the film, or I'm sorry, of the flat surface, then our two contact angles are, this contact angle would be the contact angle to the tangent of this rough, uh, uh, of this uh, relief feature would be theta naught, while the observed contact angle would be this, uh, this angle with the, uh, with the plane defined by this, uh, by this surface. So in such a scenario, suppose we said that theta naught was 90 degrees then using our equations up here and a phi of 0 0.2, we could calculate a theta of 143 uh, degrees. Now, the surface tension gives rise to very strong forces like the, uh, like the capillary force, well, gives rise to the capillary force, which is responsible among many other more important things for the formation of sandcastles. Remember at the beginning of class, I asked, or beginning of the quarter, I asked how do you make sandcastles and what do you need? You need sand and water, but how much water? If you have just a little bit of water, you don't get enough of the enough surfaces to have menisci between them. And if you have too much water, so you take the sand castle and you submerge it in water, then you don't have any meniscus at all to draw the particles together. 
So capillary forces between surfaces tend to be of similar magnitudes to Van der Waals forces. So if you touch a surface, that uh, stickiness that you feel is some combination of Van der Waals forces plus capillary forces. Um, they're both, they both give macroscopically feelable, macroscopically detectable forces to our, uh, to our fingers. So capillary forces, these are produced by the Laplace pressure. And if we consider a round surface in the vicinity of a flat surface with some humidity or liquid film that produces a meniscus, and the surface is the surfaces are uh, big, uh, capital D apart. We have uh, radii of this that characterize this um, this meniscus, R1 and R2. Sorry, R1 is here, and then this radius is R2. The distance between the top of the meniscus and the bottom of the uh, of the round feature is lowercase d the radius of the uh, the radius of the sp spherical particle or the radius of curvature of a curved uh, tip is r and the angle between the center point and the edge of this meniscus is phi, different phi from over there, sorry. And this is the condition where R is much greater than, uh, than D and small uh, small phi's. We're not going to derive this, but we will uh, we will we'll derive it for uh, for for any uh, small distance, or we'll show it for any small distance, and then just show you what it is for force for surfaces in contact. So the force as a function of distance is minus four pi r times the surface tension cosine theta times 1 minus d over 2 r1 cosine theta and using Israel really simplifications the final result is minus 4 pi r gamma cosine theta over one plus big D over little d. How about two surfaces in contact? Two surfaces in contact is a much more, um, uh, is a much more useful uh, uh, useful relation for our purposes. So F at D equals zero equals the force of adhesion due to capillary forces. So no Van der Waals component here. And this is equal to four pi R gamma cosine theta for the same
materials. So like two pieces of glass or something. But if we have two different materials, then the contact angle on each material would be different. So in that case, we have two pi r gamma times cosine of the liquid on surface 1 plus cosine of the liquid on surface 2. So in a real system where you have capillary forces plus van der Waals forces, in some cases you might also have electric double layer forces at contact, you would have, um, you would have this capillary contribution uh, as well. So uh, capillary forces for a long time, like they're, they're well known in nature. Uh, and in fact, um, has anyone seen, uh, seen a gecko climb on walls? So gecko's feet are made of I did that. <laughs> the gecko uh, toe has little hairs on it called setae. And this is something in the you know few micron. And then each one of the sete has a has a spatula or a bunch of spatula, but spatulae. Next time you're barbecuing, tell your guests. Bring out my container of spatulae. And the spatula has, uh, gives you a really high integrated contact area with a surface. So uh, a gecko can stick to a rough surface by its spatulae conforming to all of, the, uh, all of the surface asperities and you can get a really high integrated contact area. That's similar to how adhesive tape works, like pressure sensitive adhesive tape, such as scotch tape stuck to a wall. It's because that, that uh, polymer adhesive is so gummy, like there's no Van der Waals, or there's no um, covalent bonds being formed. It's just this stuff coats so cleanly over the, uh, over the surface asperities that you have a really high integrated contact area. The same thing happens with these, uh, these gecko spatulae and for uh for the the scientific literature was unconvinced of whether or not it was van der waals force or capillary force that was responsible for geckos sticking to walls because you could see how they would both they could both be operative especially since geckos typically live in uh, humid environments so there's always going to be some, uh, some liquid menisci uh, around. So there was a series of papers in the, uh, in the mid-2000s all the way up to a few years ago, actually, where, uh, where two competing research groups actually argued about this. And, ha and, and, um, and first it was, due to, uh, it was due to Van der Waals force, and then the other group said, no, it was due to capillary force because there's a humidity dependence. And the final word, the, the current understanding of how gecko feet work, and this could change, believe it or not, in 2017, this could actually change again. The current understanding is that the humidity dependence comes from the fact that as you increase the humidity, the keratin proteins of which the spatulae are made become more gummy. 
So it's not that you're, you have more menisci and more powerful capillary forces. It's actually that you have, you have more adhesive foot pads you know, because you have each one of these spatulae now has a little piece of scotch tape on it. So you're actually increasing the, uh, the ability of these spatulae to conform as a, as a function of relative humidity. So um, this is kind of a, a classic example of, uh, of intersurface forces in action. There are a lot of different types of relief structures on, um, it, in the animal kingdom that produce effects like this that, uh, that contribute to, um, to, the, uh, to the adaptive advantage. Like we talked about the, the hairs on the tips of water striders feet that keep them suspended uh, against surface tension. Um, there are certain surface dwelling um, uh, uh, mollusks and things that also uh, have these hydrophobic um, patches on their, on their bodies that they can manipulate through, uh, through movements of their bodies to, uh, to move across the, uh, across the pond, so to speak. There are a lot of reasons uh, why um, projected area and adhesion um, contribute to, uh, to uh, failure in a, um, in a semiconductor manufacturing um, scenario. So you need to make sure that your, all your stuff sticks to each other. And it's always going to be a combination of, 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 um, of balancing the needs of surface tension with Van der Waals uh, forces. So this is in general how that sort of uh, uh, stuff works. On Tuesday, we will talk about uh, the molecular basis of friction and uh, lubrication between surfaces. And um, that will be the last lecture before Thanksgiving. And after Thanksgiving, we'll have a lecture on, uh, on the basic principles of self-assembly and then we'll have the exam, then we'll have special topics in the, in the final week. So we're almost done. So thank you, have a good weekend.